Are you ready to get into y'all's word? All right, let's get right into it then today. I want you to open your Bibles with me to Deuteronomy chapter 30. We're going to begin with verse 11 in just a moment. And I've entitled this message today, Is the Torah Too Hard to Do? How many of you have heard from someone that the Torah is just too hard to do? Religion says that. Well, you know, only Yeshua, you know, was able to keep it perfectly. And when he obeyed it, he obeyed it so that he could then abolish it. It's just too hard to do. Well, we're going to find out from Scripture if that's true. Is the Torah really too hard to do? We're going to start out by reading the Torah, Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 11. It says, For this command, or this Torah, which I am commanding you today, it is not too hard for you. Isn't that amazing? The Torah itself says that the Torah is not too hard to do. It is not too hard for you, nor is it far off. It is not in the heavens to say, who shall ascend into the heavens for us and bring it to us and cause us to hear it so that we do it. Nor is it beyond the sea to say, who shall go over the sea for us and bring it to us and cause us to hear it so that we do it. Verse 14, for the word is very near you in your mouth and in your heart to do it. Now, for many people, that verse is fairly familiar because they know that Paul quoted this verse from the Torah when he taught justification by favor through belief, or as you may know, justification by grace through faith. So Paul actually quoted the Torah. So his teaching on justification is a Torah principle. Amen? So I wonder if we take a look at the correlation here that when Paul was teaching on justification by grace through faith, that he actually quoted this verse about the Torah not being too hard to do. I wonder if there's some correlation between believing in Yeshua and the Torah not being too hard to do. So let's just continue as we develop this message, and we'll see toward the end if that's the case. All right, verse 15. See, I have set before you today life and good and death and evil. In other words, it's your choice. In that I am commanding you today to love Yah, your Elohim. All right. To walk in his ways and to guard his commands and his laws and his right ruling. So to love Yah, your Elohim, is to what? Is to walk in his ways. It's to obey his commandments, his laws, and his right rulings. All right, this is the Torah definition of love. How does Elohim spell love? He spells it obedience. Amen. He wants us to walk in his ways. He wants us to obey his commands and his laws and his right rulings. It says, and you shall live. Everybody say live. Live. And increase. See, this is the outcome, the result of you loving Elohim the way he wants to be loved. You will live and increase. And Yah, your Elohim, shall bless you. In the land which you go to possess. So let's think about these words. Live, increase, and blessing. All right? So so the Torah is given to bring life and increase and blessing. All right, verse 17. But if your heart turns away. All right, so a heart that turns away is an uncircumcised heart. Keep that in mind. If your heart turns away and you do not obey... And shall be drawn away and shall bow down to other mighty ones and serve them. So there's, a, there's an outcome to that as well. Verse 18. I have declared to you today that you shall certainly perish. All right. You perish because of the hardness of your heart. Not the defect of the Torah. Keep that in mind. Or that Yah set you up for failure by giving you something you couldn't do. Why would he give you the Torah and tell you to obey it if it's too hard to do it? And by doing it, life comes to you by doing it. Then increase comes to you by doing it. Then blessing comes to you. But when you do not do it, then the scripture says you shall certainly perish. You shall not prolong your days in the land which you are passing over the Jordan to enter and possess. I have called the heavens and the earth as witnesses today against you. I have set before you, what? 
life and death. In other words, I set before you obedience and disobedience. The blessing and the curse, again, obedience and disobedience. Therefore, you shall choose life. Don't you love the way the Almighty gives a test? He gives you the question, but then he gives you the answer. All right? He says, choose life. Here's the answer. It's multiple choice. There's two choices, life or death, blessing or cursing. He says, choose life. Therefore, you shall choose life so that you live, both you and your seed, to love Yah your Elohim, to obey his voice, and to cling to him, for he is your life and the length of your days, to dwell in the land which Yah swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, to give them. All right, so again, to love Yah your Elohim is to what? Obey his voice, to cling to him. Why? He's your life and the length of your days, and you will dwell in the land which he swore to your fathers to give you. All right? Hallelujah. So there's a couple of presuppositions that are attached to this passage that we just read that says the Torah is not too hard for you. And what are these presuppositions? Number one, that the people would circumcise their hearts and their ears. All right? So it does become very difficult to do when you have uncircumcised hearts and uncircumcised ears. Amen? And secondly, that they would allow themselves to be influenced and led by the set-apart spirit. And these two things could certainly be done under the original covenant. You hear people say, well, you know, under the original covenant there was uh, not much influence of the Ruach HaKodesh. The, the scripture doesn't say that. All right? The people had uncircumcised hearts and uncircumcised ears, and they resisted the influence of the set-apart spirit when they broke covenant with Yah, all right, under the original covenant. You say, prove that out. I certainly will. Acts chapter 7, beginning with verse 51. This is Stephen preaching. Stephanos, he's preaching to the religious people of his day. He says, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. He says, you're stiff-necked, you're rebellious, and you're uncircumcised in heart and ears. Notice, you always resist the set-apart spirit. As your fathers did, you also do. So he's saying, you have resisted the set-apart spirit, but so have your fathers. And this under the original covenant. So there, there was a resisting a resistance of the set-apart spirit. Verse 52, which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who before announced the coming of the righteous one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers, who received the Torah as it was ordained by messengers, notice, but did not watch over it. See, when you have a stiff neck, and your heart is uncircumcised, and your ears are uncircumcised, and you resist the set-apart spirit, you will not watch over the Torah. In that condition, it will be very hard for you to obey the Torah. The Torah itself says it's not hard. That is, if your heart is circumcised, your ears are circumcised, and you allow the influence of the set-apart spirit, then it's not hard. Can you say amen? amen? Now, go with me over to Deuteronomy chapter 10, starting with verse 12. The Torah commands that men circumcise their hearts. Verse 12. And now, Israel, what is Yah your Elohim asking of you but to fear Yah your Elohim, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, and to serve Yah your Elohim with all your heart, and with all your being, to guard the commands of Yah and his laws, which I command you today, notice, for your good. Religion says, you know, that, that the Torah, especially under the, the new covenant, is no longer for our good. It's a bunch of laws that we just, you know, makes us legalists, and uh, we need to just abolish it, right? But the scripture says that the Torah was given for our good. It's not for our detriment. 
Verse 14, see the heavens and the heaven of heavens belong to Yah, your Elohim, also the earth with all that is in it. Yah delighted only in your fathers to love them, and he chose their seed after them, you above all peoples as it is today. Verse 16, and you shall circumcise the foreskin of your heart and harden your neck no more. So you are to circumcise the foreskin of your heart. That's cutting away that resistance and that rebellion, that desire to disobey, to do your own thing. All right? And you're to harden your neck no more. But the scripture tells us they didn't do those things. They broke the covenant. And so with a circumcised heart and with the help of the set-apart spirit, Yah's commandments are not too hard to do even under the original covenant. But they didn't allow for those things, and they ended up breaking that original covenant. All right? So the same thing is repeated in the apostolic writings. We see in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 3, it says, For this is the love of Elohim. So this is John making a reference here to Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 11. He says, this is the love for Elohim, or this is how we love Elohim, that we guard or obey his commands. Whose commands? Elohim's commands. Now, people want to parse things, and they say, well, this is talking about just Yeshua's commands, and Yeshua only gave us two commandments, you know, to love, to love Yah and to love people. And, and then they give themselves the latitude and the liberty to define exactly what that means according to their own desires. But this is not talking about Messiah's commands, Yeshua's commands as being love Yah and love people, according to the way they think it ought to be. This is talking about Elohim's commands. For this is the love for Elohim, or this is how we love Elohim, that we guard or obey His, Elohim's, commands. And His commands are not heavy. Now, where do you find that? This is in the apostolic writings or what Christianity calls the New Testament. And yet it's a direct reference to the Torah portion that we read just a moment ago, Deuteronomy 30, verse 11. For this command or this Torah, which I am commanding you today, is not too hard for you. His commandments are not heavy. That's what it says in the apostolic writings. It is not too hard for you. That's what it says in the Torah, saying the exact same things. Can you say amen? amen. 2 John chapter 1, verse 6, it says, And this is the love that we walk according to His commands. The context is talking about the Father's commands here. This is the command that as you have heard from the beginning, keep that in mind, you should walk in it. Now, what commands had they heard from the beginning? The Torah commands. They were very familiar with the Torah commands. They they received those commandments when Moshe received them on the mountain. Can you say amen? This is the command that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. All right, look at John chapter 14, verse 15. Yeshua said, if you love me, you shall guard or obey my commands. Now, what commands would he be talking about here? He's talking about Torah commands. You say, how do you prove that out? Well, Matthew 5, he says, if anyone disobeys and teaches others to disobey these commandments, they'll be least in the kingdom. If anyone obeys these commandments and teaches others to obey these commandments, that person will be great in the kingdom. And then continue in the sermon. And what do you discover? He quotes the Ten Commandments, but he also quotes Torah commandments. So when he says these commandments, he's talking about Torah commandments. If you love me, you shall guard or obey my commands. All right? So Yeshua says that expressing love for him is based upon your willingness to obey his commands. Would he ask you to love him through obedience and then give you commands that are too hard for you to keep? He would be setting you up for failure. Yeshua, your 
Master, your Messiah said, if you love me, keep my commandments. What's he doing here? Simply quoting the Torah. The Torah says the same thing. Amen. And he's not setting us up for failure by saying obedience is how you spell love to me. And I want you to obey my commandments. Oh, by the way, they're too hard for you to obey. Is that what he said? No, he said, obey them. If you obey them, you're expressing your love for me. Amen. So the issue has never been that the Torah is too hard to obey. The issue has always been the hardness of man's heart. Let me say that again. It's never been an issue that the Torah is too hard to obey. Now, religion will tell you that. And some of you are looking back at me like a cow at a new gate right now because I'm saying something you haven't heard before. Amen. Because religion has taught you that the Torah commandments are too hard to obey. The scripture doesn't say that, but religion has taught that. Yeshua said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And we know he stood with the Torah commandments. He's not going to give you commandments that you cannot obey. That's too hard for you to obey. So what is the issue here? The issue has always been the hardness of man's heart. You see, if you circumcise your heart and your ears, if you get rid of that old stiff neck, if you allow the influence of the Ruach HaKodesh in your life, then the power of the Spirit will enable you to keep the commandments. Amen? Because he gives you what? He gives you the desire to, and he gives you the power to. Can you say amen? amen. All right, let's go a little further. Galatians chapter 3, beginning with verse 21. This is Shaul, or the Apostle Paul, writing here. It says, is the Torah then against the promises of Elohim? Let it not be. For if a Torah had been given that was able to make alive. What does that really mean when we look deeply into it? It says, if a Torah had been given that was able to make one obedient. All right, you remember what the Torah commandments did for you if you obeyed them? They brought life. Isn't that right? Life and increase and blessing. For if a Torah had been given that was able to make alive or able to make one obedient, truly righteousness would have been by Torah. But the scripture has shut up all mankind under sin. In other words, under disobedience. That the promise by belief in Yeshua Messiah might be given to those who believe. All right, so this is not an indictment against the Torah, as religion would like to try to imply. This is an indictment against the heart condition of man. The Torah is the guidelines and instructions of our Creator. Man has to choose to obey them. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 7. For if that first covenant or marriage arrangement had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Okay, this is the place where religion comes in and says, see, the Torah was at fault. There was something wrong with the Torah. So we needed to get rid of the Torah. See, that Torah was just weak and no good. And it's the Torah's fault that the people weren't able to obey it because nobody can obey it. It's too hard to obey. But is that what it's really saying here? For if that first covenant or marriage arrangement between Yah and his people had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. A second what? Marriage arrangement. A second covenant. Look at verse 8. For finding fault with them. Now, he could have easily said right here, the writer of Hebrews, for finding fault with the Torah. 
But that's not what it says. For finding fault with them. He says, see, the days are coming, says Yah, when I shall conclude with the house of Israel and with the house of Yehuda a renewed or a new covenant, a new marriage arrangement, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Mitzrayim, the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them. He disregarded them. He did not disregard his Torah, his commandments. He said they broke the covenant. How do you break the covenant? Through disobedience. How do you break the covenant? By choosing death and the curse over life and the blessing. See, see love is a choice. The Almighty doesn't force people. You're, we're not robots. He doesn't take away our, our will. He allows us to choose. Love is a choice. And he's saying under the first covenant, the first marriage arrangement, they broke their marriage vows because they chose to disobey. And when they chose to disobey, it brought death and cursing upon them. And he says, I disregarded them. The scripture doesn't say that the Almighty disregarded his Torah. It never says that. Look at verse 10. Because this is the covenant I shall make with the house of Israel. By the way, the covenant still with the house of Israel. After those days, says Yah, giving my laws or my Torah in their mind. I'm going to place my Torah in their minds. And I shall write them on their hearts. All right? He's going to write his commands on our hearts. So has the Torah been abolished? Now this is definitive of the new covenant. The new covenant that we have with the Almighty through Yeshua and His blood. What is definitive? The fact that He places His Torah in our mind and He writes it upon our hearts. It hadn't been abolished. Now how foolish it would be for the Almighty to place His Torah on our minds and write it in our hearts if it's too hard to do. But religion will tell you it's too hard to do. And since it's too hard to do, we're not even going to try. It's an excuse for lawlessness, folks. It just is. And many are sincere, but they're sincerely wrong about this. They can't back it in Scripture. Anytime a religion wants to start quoting its fathers... Instead of quoting the scripture, you know we have a problem. Amen? Giving my laws in their mind. Now, why would he put it in your mind if it was too hard to do? And I shall write them on their hearts. Why would he put a law in your heart that's too hard to do? And I shall be their Elohim, and they shall be my people. The fact that you have his Torah in your mind and written on your hearts is the reason why he says he's going to be your Elohim, and you're going to be his people. He's not your Elohim if you don't have his Torah in your mind and written on your heart. And you're not his people if you don't have his Torah in your mind and written on your heart. It's definitive. You can't get away from it. Now, go with me over to Romans chapter 3. By the way, this is the book that religion says that Paul uses to abolish the Torah. So we're seeing that the fault is with the hardness of man's heart, not with the Torah. Romans chapter 3, beginning with verse 9. What then are we, speaking of the Jews, better than they, the non-Jews? Not at all. For we have previously accused both Yehudim, both Jews and Greeks... That they are all under sin. That's everybody. All mankind have transgressed the Torah. All under sin. As it has been written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Now, Shaul is going to build a real case here. He's going to quote mostly the Psalms. But he's going to build a powerful case that mankind has fallen deeply into sin that their hearts have become 
so hard, their ears have become so deaf that they are so lost and they need a Savior. All right? As it has been written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is no one who is understanding. There is none who is seeking Elohim. They all have turned aside. They have together become worthless. There is none who does good. No, not one. Now he's quoting from Psalm 14, verses 1 through 3. He's quoting from Psalm 53, verses 1 through 4. Verse 13, their throat is an open tomb with their tongues. They have deceived, that's Psalm 5, verse 9. Their poison of adders is under their lips, that's Psalm 140, verse 3. Whose mouth is filled with cursing and bitterness, that's Psalm 10, verse 7. Their feet are swift to shed blood, that's Proverbs 1, verse 16. Ruin and wretchedness are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known, that's Isaiah 59, verse 7. There is no fear of Elohim before their eyes. That's Psalm 36, verse 1. And we know that whatever the Torah says, it says to those who are in the Torah, speaking of the Jews, so that every mouth might be stopped and all the world come under judgment before Elohim. Therefore, by works of Torah, no flesh shall be declared right before him. That's Psalm 143, 2. For by the Torah is the knowledge of sin. So he's describing the condition of mankind and how they've fallen into the depths of sin and depravity. They're not obeying the Torah because of their condition, because of their hard hearts, because of their uncircumcised ears, because of their rebellion and resistance. Look at Psalm 143, 1. It says, hear my prayer, O Yah, give ear to my pleadings in your trustworthiness. Answer me in your righteousness and do not enter into right ruling or judgment with your servant. Here it is. This is the verse that, that Paul uses in this discourse when he's building the case about how deeply into sin and depravity the human race has fallen. It says, for before you, no one living is in the right before you, no one living is in the right. All right. He says it in another way. Paul does here. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the esteem of Elohim. And then Yermiyahu, Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. The heart is crooked above all and desperately sick. Who shall know it? I, Yah, search the heart. I try the kidneys. And give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. All right. So Paul makes it clear concerning the depth of depravity that the human race had fallen into. We see even further in Romans chapter 1, beginning with verse 18. It says that Yah gave the human race over to their own evil inclinations. For the wrath of Elohim is revealed from heaven against all wickedness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Look at verse 21. Because although they knew Elohim, they knew him through the witness of creation, they did not esteem him as Elohim, nor gave thanks, but became vain in their reasonings, and their undiscerning heart was darkened. In other words, their heart was uncircumcised. It became darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and changed the esteem of the incorruptible Elohim into the likeness of an image of corruptible man and of birds and of four-footed beasts and of reptiles. Verse 24, therefore Elohim gave them up. All right, so now we see Yah just giving them over. To their own evil inclinations. He's giving them up. He's allowing them to be who they want to be. And live how they want to live. Therefore Elohim gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts. Again, their uncircumcised hearts. To disrespect their bodies among themselves. 
verse 25, who changed the truth of Elohim into the falsehood and worshiped and served what was created rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Now look at verse 26. Because of this, Elohim gave them over to degrading passions. He allowed them to pursue their own evil passions. Verse 28, and even as they did not think it worthwhile to possess the knowledge of Elohim, Elohim gave them over to a worthless mind. Are you getting the picture? Now their minds are worthless. To do what is improper, having been filled with all unrighteousness, and you can read all those things that they were doing, verse 32, who though they know the righteousness of Elohim, that those who practice such deserve death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. All right, so this is the condition of the unregenerated human race. So the question is, is the problem with the law or is the problem with lawbreakers? They wanted to live that way, so the Almighty gave them up. He gave them over to that. They spiraled deeper and deeper into dark depravity and sinfulness. Now, do you think in that condition that they're praising the fact that the Torah is easy to do? Oh, it's not too hard. Oh, no, it's, it's very, very hard for these people in this condition. And it's hard for religious people whose minds are still cluttered with doctrine that doesn't line up with Scripture. So go with me over to Romans chapter 7. Notice I'm using a lot of the writings of Paul, the one they say abolished the Torah. Romans chapter 7, beginning with verse 7, is Torah sin? Is Torah sin? Is Torah this bad thing we need to get rid of? Romans 7, verse 7. What then shall we say? Is the Torah sin? In other words, Shaul is simply saying, is the issue with the Torah? Let it not be. However, I did not know sin except through the Torah. For also the covetousness, I knew not if the Torah had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, or you could say the sin nature in man's flesh or the wicked inclinations of man, the reason that he needs to have his heart circumcised. But sin, having taken the occasion through the command, did work in me all sorts of covetousness. For apart from Torah, sin is dead. You don't know what sin is without the Torah. The Torah will define for us what sin is. What happens when you abolish the Torah in your religion? You have no clue of what sin is. When you have no clue of what sin is, what happens? Lawlessness. And religion is going to adopt more and more lawlessness as time unfolds in preparation for the coming of the lawless one. Because when there is no law, the lawless one will rise up in that environment and declare himself the law. Now, you'll take my mark, you'll obey what I say, or else. That's why those of us that have been enlightened, those of us that have had our eyes opened, and we're hearing from the Spirit in these days, and there's this wonderful restoration of the Torah back to the body of Messiah. We need not to be silent. We need to preach it from the housetops. Amen. We need to share it with love because there are people who are stuck in religious Babylon who will come out when they hear the truth. Can you say amen? But sin, having taken the occasion through the command, did work in me all sorts of covetousness. For apart from Torah, sin is dead. And I was alive apart from the Torah once. In other words, I didn't know what sin was. But when the command came, the sin revived. In other words, my evil inclinations 
came alive when I came to know the commandment. And I died, he says. Verse 10. And the command which was to result in life. Well, Shaul knew what the Torah said about the Torah itself bringing life. And the command which was to result in life, this I found to result in death. Now, let's go a little deeper in understanding this. Because of my evil inclinations that drove me to transgress the commandment. His evil inclination drove him to transgress the commandment when the commandment became known to him. Verse 11, for sin, or my evil inclinations, having taken the occasion through the command. In other words, once I came to know what sin was, deceived me. So sin deceived me, or my evil inclinations drove me to transgress. And through it, killed me. Verse 12, so that the Torah truly is set apart. Your Bible may say holy. And this is from the one that religion says abolished the Torah. So the Torah truly is set apart or holy. And the command set apart and righteous and good. Now, what what would happen if we went around abolishing everything that was set apart, righteous and good? What would we have left if we went around in the name of our religion abolishing everything set apart, righteous, and good? And yet, Shaul is saying the Torah, the instructions and the guidelines of our Creator, the Torah is set apart. The commandment is set apart and righteous and Good. What is he really saying here? In other words, the problem is not with the Torah. Therefore, verse 13, has that which is good become death to me? Let it not be. But the sin, the evil inclinations of my heart, that sin might be manifest, or recognized, was working death in me through what is good, the Torah, so that sin, through the command, might become an exceedingly great sinner. In other words, clearly exposed. Yah has built a clear case against us in the high court of heaven. Our hearts need to be circumcised and we need the assistance of the set apart spirit. Because of the evil inclinations within us, when we come into contact with the command, when we understand you shall not covet, the evil inclinations within us want to covet and drive us to covet. There's a war that takes place on the inside of us. And those who are not walking with Yah, those whose hearts are not circumcised, and those who are not influenced by the set-apart spirit are overcome by the evil inclinations of our flesh. We give in. So we end up doing the very thing we don't want to do. Am I making it clear? Look at verse 14. For we know that the Torah is spiritual. Well, he's still praising the Torah. How is it that he abolished the Torah? He's praising the Torah all through the book of Romans. For we know that the Torah is spiritual. Well, what about people that say it's just legalistic? Shaul says the Torah is spiritual. But I am fleshly. So now he's pointing out the problem, is he not? Is the problem with the Torah? He says, the Torah is spiritual, but I'm fleshly. The problem's with me. Notice, sold under sin, enslaved to my evil inclinations. So the reality is we need to our something, but it's not the Torah. 
We need to abolish our slavery to our evil inclinations. For what I work or what I do, I know not. For what I wish or what I desire, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. You see the battle? But if I do what I do not wish, in other words, if I give in to the evil inclinations of my flesh, I agree with the Torah that it is good. And now it is no longer I that work it or that do it, but the sin, the evil inclinations dwelling in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good. For to wish or to desire is present with me, but to work or to do the good, and the good is defined by what? The Torah. We don't get to define good. The Almighty defines good. He defines it by His Torah. If you obey the Torah, you're doing good. If you disobey the Torah, you're doing evil. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good. For to wish or to desire is present with me, but to work or to do the good I do not find. For the good that I wish to do, that's obedience to the Torah, I do not do. But the evil I do not wish to do, that's disobedience to the Torah, this I practice. And if I do that which I do not wish, it is no longer I who work it or do it, but the sin, the evil inclinations dwelling in me. I find, therefore, this law, that when I wish or desire to do the good, that the evil is present with me. Again, he's saying, when I wish to do the Torah, to obey the Torah, there are still evil inclinations within me. For I delight in the Torah of Elohim according to the inward man. What? Shaul delights in the Torah of Elohim? How can he be the poster child for abolishing the Torah when he delights in the Torah of Elohim according to his spirit man, the inward man? And that's a reference to Psalm 119.16. He's just quoting the Psalms there. But I see another Torah or another law in my members. There's another dynamic that's going on in the members of my physical body. Battling against the Torah or the law of my mind. The Torah of of your mind is your will. So there's a, there's a, a law within your members or a dynamic within your members, the members of your physical body that's at war with your will. And bringing me into captivity to the Torah or the law of sin, which is in my members. Look at verse 24. Wretched man that I am. So we see here who the problem is with. The problem is not with the Torah. The problem is with mankind. Because we discover we are wretches. Even if we want to obey and want to do the good. We have this dynamic in our flesh that wants to deceive us and drive us into transgressing the Torah. And the scripture speaks of it as if it's an evil taskmaster, that we're in slavery to it. He says, I'm a wretched man. When I come to this conclusion, I want to do good, and yet this warfare is going on on the inside of me. I want to obey the Torah, but I'm unable to. In this condition, what condition? The condition that that we read about, the, the depravity that the human race had fallen into in that condition. All right? So he says, wretched man am I. Notice he's not saying the Torah is wretched. The Torah must be abolished. If we get rid of that thing that defines sin, there won't be any more sin. But isn't that what religion is saying these days? Let's get rid of the Torah. If we get rid of the Torah, nobody will know what sin is. Nobody will have a consciousness of sin. We'll all just do what's right in our own eyes. And we'll be like sitting ducks waiting for the anti-Messiah to arrive. The lawless one. Look, religion is working hand in glove with 
the mystery of lawlessness, with that dynamic that's taking place right now. You see, the most popular doctrines in religion are doctrines of lawlessness. I call it perverted grace. Grace gives us a license to do whatever we want to. That's the doctrine. But it's not according to Scripture, folks. You have to cherry pick the Scripture horribly to come up with a doctrine like that. The good news in Yeshua, Yeshua whose life was defined by perfect obedience, Yeshua now that He has taken the sin of the world upon Himself, died on the tree, was buried and raised, went to the right hand, poured out the same set-apart spirit that when we're filled with a set-apart spirit, we're set apart. Is Yeshua now issuing licenses to sin? Is He making it okay for us to live the way we want to live, do what's right in our own eyes, ignore the Torah, continue in the spiral down into this dark depravity? Is He making it okay? Of course not. Wretched man that I am. Notice, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Or who shall make the Torah not too hard to do? Who's going to deliver me from this body of death? Who's going to give me the tools that I need to be able to obey the Torah and do the good? Who shall make the Torah not too hard to do? Verse 25, thanks to Elohim through Yeshua Messiah, our master. So then with the mind or with my will, I myself truly serve the Torah of Elohim. Again, Paul, Shaul, continues to praise the Torah of Elohim. He says, with my will, I truly serve, not abolish, serve the Torah of Elohim. See, if the flaw was with the Torah, then why would Paul say that his will is to serve the Torah of Elohim? But with the flesh, the Torah of sin. The evil inclinations in my flesh. Now let's go on to Romans chapter 8. Begin with verse 1 because this is a continuation of what's been talked about in chapter 7. It says, There is then now no condemnation to those who are in Yeshua Messiah. Now religion wants to stop right there and say, Well, you know, if you're walking out, repeat a prayer, you make a mental ascension that Jesus is the Christ, there's no condemnation. You can live any way you want to live, point forward, and there's no condemnation because you're in Yeshua. But Shaul doesn't stop right there. There's something beyond the comma, so to speak. There is then now no condemnation to those who are in Yeshua Messiah, who do not walk according to the flesh. What does that mean? Giving in to the evil inclinations of the flesh in disobedience to the Torah. Amen. Do we need to say la right there for a moment or two? There's no condemnation if you don't give in to the evil inclinations of your flesh. But... You walk according to the Spirit. If you walk in the Spirit, you will not transgress the Torah. There is no Torah against the Spirit. Shaul said that in another place. There's no Torah, there's no law against the fruit of the Spirit, the life of the Spirit. You remember what we said earlier? That the Torah is not hard to do if you've dealt with your stiff neck and you've circumcised your heart and your ears and you allow the influence of the Spirit in your life, then the Torah is not hard to do. 
In other words, obedience is not hard to do. You can love Yeshua the way he wants to be loved. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. But religion likes to teach us that if we love him, we need to abolish the commandments. Because grace allows us to live any way we want to live. You can't support it in Scripture, folks. Let's read it all together. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is then now no condemnation to those who are in Messiah Yeshua. He said, who's going to deliver me from this body of, of sin? Who do not walk according to the flesh, giving in to the evil inclinations of the flesh and disobedience to the Torah, but according to the Spirit. For the Torah of the Spirit of life in Messiah Yeshua, the law of the Spirit of life in Messiah Yeshua has set me free from that Torah of sin, that dynamic we were talking about, where we were deceived by the evil inclinations that are in our flesh, driving us to transgress the Torah. Do you see it? For the Torah of the Spirit of life in Messiah Yeshua has set me free from the Torah of sin and of death. For the Torah being powerless, in other words, to accomplish righteousness in man. In that it was weak through the flesh or because of the evil inclinations of the flesh. Elohim, having sent his own son in the likeness of flesh of sin or in the likeness of sinful flesh. And according to sin, or because of the evil inclinations of the flesh, condemned sin in the flesh. In other words, he made a way for man to escape the evil inclinations of the flesh. He set us free from the nature of sin in our flesh. He set us free from the evil inclinations that drive us to transgress the Torah. Hallelujah. Verse 4, this is so good. So that the righteousness of the Torah should be completed in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. The righteous requirement of the Torah. Wait a minute, I thought the Torah had been abolished. Why is there a righteous requirement of the Torah? Shaul is saying the righteous requirement of the Torah is completed in us. In other words, we obey the Torah. We have the power to be obedient. It's completed in us who do not walk according to the flesh. We don't give in to those evil inclinations of our flesh, but according to the Spirit. In other words, he makes the Torah not too hard to do. Hallelujah. Because the Torah was hard to do in that wicked, depraved state of the human race. With that harsh slave master of the evil inclinations of our flesh driving us to transgress the Torah. So what does Yeshua do? What does Elohim, the Almighty, do to allow us to obey the Torah with ease. Does he abolish the Torah? No, he deals with the evil inclination of the flesh to set us free from that. And to give us a pathway through the Spirit. Remember, get your heart circumcised. Allow the Spirit to influence you. Then you'll not give in to the evil inclinations of your flesh. When you're free from the evil inclinations of your flesh, you can obey with ease. I didn't get up this morning and say, oh, man, i got to try to obey, but it's so hard. That's what religion teaches. Verse 4, so that the righteousness of the Torah or the righteous requirement of the Torah should be completed in us. We're going to obey the Torah who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Verse 5, for those who live according to the flesh 
set their minds on the matters of the flesh. They set their minds or their will on doing the evil inclinations of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the matters or the deeds or the fruit of the Spirit. For the mind or the will of the flesh is death. Well, isn't that what the Torah taught us? For the mind or the will of the flesh, those who disobey. What comes when we disobey the Torah? Death. For the mind or the will of the flesh is death. Death comes through disobedience. But the mind or the will of the Spirit is what? Life and peace. Life comes through obedience to the Torah. You see, it all comes together. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19. I have called the heavens and the earth as witness today against you. I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. Therefore, you shall choose life. Here's the answer. Choose life. So that you live, both you and your seed, to love Yah, your Elohim, to obey his voice and to cling to him. For he is your life and the length of your days. So back to Romans chapter 8. We have just a few more verses here. Let's pick up at verse 7. Because the mind or the will of the flesh is what? Enmity towards Elohim. If you have a will to give in to the evil inclinations of your flesh, that will is an enemy of the Almighty. For it does not subject itself to the Torah of Elohim. I mean, this ought to be amazing to some of you who thought that Paul used the book of Romans to abolish the Torah. He's saying when you're all in your will concerning your flesh and you want to do those evil inclinations, that in itself makes you an enemy of the Almighty. Why? Because it does not subject itself, that evil will, that fleshly will, does not subject itself to the Torah of Elohim. In other words, it's not going to obey the Torah. Neither indeed is it able. And those who are in the flesh are unable to please Elohim. How are you going to please Elohim? By obeying his Torah. Isn't that interesting? That evil will of the flesh does not subject itself to the Torah. It doesn't please Elohim through obedience. And it's not even able to, the scripture says. And those who are in the flesh and living by the flesh and giving in to the evil inclinations are unable to please Elohim. How do you please Elohim? How do you love Elohim? By obeying his commandments. Verse 9. But you are not in the flesh or under bondage to the evil inclinations of the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of Elohim dwells in you, and if anyone does not have the spirit of Messiah, this one is not his. So it's definitive, folks. It's definitive to have the spirit of Messiah living in us. It's definitive that the spirit of Messiah living in us delivers us from our evil inclinations, those evil inclinations of the flesh. And gives us a pathway to obedience that pleases Elohim. With the Spirit working in us. The Torah is most definitely not too hard to do. Now a couple of scriptures here. We're going to close this out. So in the new covenant. Yah will circumcise our hearts. By the set apart spirit. And calls us to obey his Torah. We see that in the Torah. Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 6. And Yah your Elohim shall circumcise your heart. And the heart of your seed. Your children. To love Yah your Elohim with all your heart. And with all your being. So that you might live. In the new covenant. It is the work of the Ruach. HaKodesh. The set apart spirit. To circumcise our hearts. 
to liberate us from the evil inclination of the flesh. Colossians chapter 2, verse 11. In him, in Messiah, you were also circumcised with a circumcision not made with hands in the putting off of the body of the sins of the flesh, the evil inclinations of the flesh, by the circumcision of Messiah, having been buried with him in immersion, in which you also were raised with him through the belief in the working of Elohim, who raised him from the dead. So when we believe upon Yeshua and we're water baptized, then by the Spirit, Messiah circumcises our hearts. Things change internally. Amen? Amen. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 3, For we are the circumcision, those of us who believe in Yeshua, who are serving Elohim in what? The Spirit and boasting in Messiah Yeshua and do not trust in the flesh. And then a, a passage that we quote every time we gather, as we begin our gathering, Ezekiel chapter 36, beginning with verse 25. And this is the prophet prophesying of the new covenant. The new covenant that we are in with Yah through Yeshua. And his Shed blood is the blood of that new covenant. Yah says, And I shall sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your filthiness. You remember all that depravity we talked about? The condition of, of the human race? And from all your idols, I cleanse you. This is what happens in the new covenant. And I shall give you a new heart. He's going to take out that old heart of stone and give us a new heart. We need a new heart. This is how we're going to overcome the evil inclinations that reside within us. We get a new heart. He's not going to put a band-aid on the old heart and put a new spirit within you. And I shall take the heart of stone, the heart of rebellion, the heart of resistance, the heart of making excuses the heart of embracing doctrines that give you a pass on obedience. I'm going to take that old stony heart out of your flesh and I shall give you a heart of flesh. A heart of flesh is, is one that's pliable, one that's warm, one that's, that wants to obey. He gives us the want to. Yeah. Amen. You know somebody's truly born again when they want to obey. Yeah. Now we, we have to be careful because, you know, we... We can't reach their ears when we lop off their heads, right? So, so you have to have a strategy. But the reality is, you can know this, when somebody's arguing with you about obedience, they do not want to obey. You begin to wonder whether or not they've actually experienced the new birth. Now, some people just need to be taught. Those people are low-hanging fruit. Once you teach them, boy, they're, they can't believe that they have inherited lies and worthlessness in their religious experience and they're ready to go as soon as they hear the truth. But some people are like a piece of fruit on the top of the tree. You climb all the way up there and you're pulling on it. They don't want to let go. You can spend up all your time pulling on fruit that doesn't want to let go when there's plenty of low-hanging branches with fruit that's ready to be picked. Can you say Amen. And I shall give you a heart of flesh, the want to, the want to be obedient, and put my spirit within you. That's the power to. So you get the want to and the power to. Now, if you have the want to and the power to, do you think being obedient has become easy? If you have the want to and the power to, it's in line with what the Torah says. That the Torah is not hard to do when you have the want to and the power to. When your neck is no longer stiff. You ever wake up with a stiff neck? I mean, it's hard to do anything, you know. You get that worked out and things are a lot easier. Your heart becomes circumcised. He gives you the, the want to and the power to. Now look at the, the next phrase. And I shall cause you. To walk in my laws and guard my right rulings and you shall do them. 
In other words, they will not be too hard for you to do. Because he causes us to walk in his laws and guard his right rulings. And he says, in this new covenant that we're in with him, through Yeshua and his shed blood, that we will do his commandments with his help. We get a circumcised heart. Hallelujah. And we get his spirit. And through his spirit, we're able to keep his commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah.